I don't know how many of you are into sports. I mean, I, I like them, but uh, everybody knows if you played sports that in order for you to succeed, you need a good balance of offense and defense. Uh, I tell my daughters uh, that I'm trying to get them into volleyball. It's a sport that I kind of like, at least my, my youngest one. She's tall enough for it. You need a good offense. You need a spike, and you need to, be able to hit the ball hard, but you also need to be able to defend, and you need to be able to do that. Yesterday, uh, my Iowa Hawkeyes beat the uh, Minnesota Gophers, who were undefeated, and um, they had to have offense in the beginning of the year, uh, in the beginning of the game, and it's what kind of propelled them to a lead. But at the end, it was ultimately defense um, that sealed the victory in a tight thing. You need a, a balance of offense and defense. I think you need that in all kinds of, uh, of areas of life. You need to be on the offensive and try new things, and you need to defend as well. Well, the reason why I bring up this isn't just to talk sport, to brag about my Hawkeyes. I want you to think about this. That there's two ways that we kind of go about life. And the reason is, is we are going through the book of Titus, and we've entitled this sermon series, Everyday Theology. And we are, find ourselves right after the section where Paul lays out his number one task for his um, pastoral protege, and that is Titus, who he's re- write, writing this letter to. That's why it's called that. Um, Titus is a letter written from the Apostle Paul, who's a leader in the church, to his pastoral protege, to, who he had left in the island of Crete to kind of get things in order and to become the pastor there. And the first task last week that he set up, was, he said to do, was to set up elders, And we looked at all the qualifications that they need to have and to look at not only their character, but a little bit of their job. And today we're going to look at even more what their job is and how they engage with the culture that, as we've said over the course of the last couple of weeks, is kind of um, not exactly the best culture to be in. Um, We'll see in our passage today how their own people describe them. And so what we'll see is that Paul encourages Titus and the elders to be both offensive and defensive when it comes to false teachers. And so if you want to follow along with me, you can grab your Bibles. It's good to have your own Bibles or grab one of the, red, uh, the blue ones in the seats in front of you. Titus 1, 10 through 16, we read the NIV here. That's the translation you'll hear. Um, but I encourage you to have it out and to read with me. Um, even though you can just hear it, it's good to see it and um, follow along that way. But here is uh, the word of the Lord. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. The saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in faith and will pay no attention to the Jewish myths or merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure... All is pu- things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but their actions, by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now, I mean, this is a pretty complicated text. I mean, there's a, a lot of stuff in here, but ultimately, what we see here is the situation is that false teachers. Um, are attacking the church and trying to lead them astray. And so when Paul told Titus that he needed to set up elders, the jo- one of the main jobs we said last week of the elders was to be the spiritual leaders of the church, to help manage them and help protect them, to teach and to help them see what the truth is. That's the ultimate job of the elders here um, of this church, is to make sure that truth is taught and that we do what we can to, to manage the household of God, to lead you in, in following, God, becoming more like Christ. That's our ultimate goal. And so what we see here is that this is the situation that the church is in disarray. It's a church plant. They didn't have these kind of structures in place. And so the first task is to set up the elders. And now what we see is that Paul is encouraging them, telling them what to do. But the situation, we can infer that there are false teachers who are negatively impacting the Cretan church. Now, we don't have a ton of information about this. You know, some letters like the book of Galatians, we kind of have a pretty clear idea of what they're teaching. Paul lays it out kind of passage by passage and refutes it. In this one, he just kind of hints that there's false teachers and that they're doing negative things. And we have to infer from this passage kind of what they're teaching. But what we do see is how he characterizes them. And he says four things about these teachers that we see in Titus 1, 1, 10, and also a little bit in 11. 
the first thing he uses to describe them is that they're rebellious. Now, ultimately, the rebellion is because they're unwilling to submit to what the Bible teaches. He says that, that they teach what isn't true. And so we see that maybe they're not rebellious and like reading, leading a revolt against the, the, the community and the leaders or any of that sense, but they are rebelling against what truth is. And so he describes them as rebellious people. The next phrase that we see there is meaningless talk. These are empty talkers. They're full of hot air. The phrase uh, uh, windbag or blowhard is literally almost exactly what that Greek, term phrase, that Greek phrase means. It means that they talk in big, flowery language, but they have vaporous content. I ripped that off from somebody. I forget who it was. They peddled big words with vaporous content. How many of you know people like that? That They like to use all kinds of jargon. They kind of use all this flowery language that sounds good, but ultimately you're like, what did you just say? I have no idea. And half the time they don't even know themselves, right? Right? This describes the, the people that, they're, that he is coming against. They're using everything they can to win people over, to show how smart they are, but ultimately they're rebellious and their words are hollow because they don't have the truth. The second thing that we, or third thing we see is that they're of Jewish descent. That's what he means when they say uh, they're the circumcision group. Um, and what we mean by that is just that there is uh, probably the Jewish influence here, and we're not exactly tr- sure exactly what they're teaching. It hints at myths and genealogies, and, and there's that kind of thing in the book of Titus. But there was a huge population of Jews on Crete, and so it makes sense that some of these people are coming in and trying to influence the church. But the last thing we see is that their motive was financial gain. So, I mean, this is not really great teachers, right? I mean, they're rebellious. They're not speaking the truth. They're using all kinds of language to try and um, win people over and show how powerful and smart they are. But their words are hollow. They have no depth to them at all. And then, not on top of that, they're trying to make themselves rich and get financial gain. And what we see is that this is literally destroying households. Now, that phrase household can mean families, and it can have that kind of a connotation, but it can literally mean like small groups and, and groups of, uh, of people in the church as well. And so what we see is that this is why Paul says we need to refute this, we need to take care of it. Now, as I said, we don't have a, a, a word-for-word kind of teaching that they're giving um, and that, that Paul's refuting. It's more of a general kind of admonition to, to fight against false teachers, which in some ways is good because we can't just say, well, this isn't the situation here, and we don't need to deal with that. No, we, we need to be on our guard against the false teachers. But I think from this passage, we can find two different kinds of false teachings that these false teachers are kind of communicating. Um, and there's two different ones that we can hit. The first one has to do with the way that the church and culture interact. Now, whether we like it or not, when two cultures come together, they are going to interact. I mean, think about if you're married, you coming together with your spouse. You each have your own culture of the way that you do things. And when you two come together, there has to be this melding and there has to be working out the details, right? I dare bet the majority of the fights you have are probably over your own rule book about the way your family does things and your spouse's rule book. And when they don't line up, then things kind of get a little dicey. But it's not just in marriage relationships. I mean, think of your friendships. We had a bunch of girls over for a, a birthday party. And, you know, everybody has their own way of doing things, whether they eat and do meals or whether they, they how do you do it? Do you say, sing? Do you sing the extra chorus at the end of a birthday? I mean, you know, there's all these internal cultural things that we have. And when those two collide, something's going to give. And what's hinted at in this passage, I think what we can infer from this line where he says that Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, and this saying is true, is that the Cretan culture and the church, when they were coming together, that there was this, this idea that it was okay for the church to be just like the Cretans. I think the reason why Paul states this and says, hey, look, you need to be realized that this is what the Cretan culture is and say that it's, it's true is really naming kind of the attitudes and the ideas of what's out there. And really the reason why he's doing it is to call the church to task to say, I think you're becoming too much like the culture around you. When your culture and the, church, the culture of the church come together, there's too much of an overlap 
And what's happening is the Christian culture is winning. And the church is becoming too much like the culture around them. And Paul is saying that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Because this is how their own people talk about them. They're liar, evildoers, lazy gluttons. And just so you know, like in Greek, the word Cretan is a verb. When you have a verb named after you, and it's for dishonest gain, it's not a great thing. It would be like, you know, I mean, it would be like the Iowans. I don't know. Our, I, I don't know what our, our Iowan verb would be. Um, but, you know, I would say we're hard worker or whatever. We're really good, right? I mean, but, but it would be a derogatory term. And that's a verb. And when that happens, you know it's not good. But that's the reputation of the Cretans. And Paul is saying, look, when the church and the culture come together, there's a way about that. And we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in a little bit. But you're going too much. When the Cretan culture is coming into you, you're allowing it to dominate. And it's, over, it's overcoming you. There, it's so much that the people couldn't tell the difference between the Cretan Christians, and the Cretans themselves. And Paul is saying, this is a bad thing. At the end of this passage, in Titus 1, verse 14 and 15, he talks about not paying attention to Jewish myths or merely human commands. And then he goes into this whole talk about pure and unpure and things being corrupted. And ultimately, what I think we can infer from this is that the false teachers were adding to the gospel. They said you needed to do something more to become pure. Ultimately, what they're saying is it's Jesus and salvation plus something. Uh, Jesus and what he did on the cross plus something equals salvation. And if you look at the majority of the letters, including the book of Galatians, is really where he hounds this pretty hard. You'll see that it's clear that the Bible teaches that it's faith in Jesus alone through grace alone that saves us. That's the way that it is. And somehow they're adding something, either mythology or genealogy or something. And we're not quite sure what it is. But really what the argument that he's making here in this pure and unpure talk is what you put your hope and trust in, 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 in terms of your relationship with Jesus matters. And if you put your hope and trust in Jesus alone, in his righteousness, in his sinless life, in his death and resurrection, in him suffering the punishment that he, we and I deserved on the cross, that he took for us, suffering of God's wrath, if when we take on his righteousness, then we're pure. You and I are not pure on our own. I mean, think about just this week. Think about just today, if you're honest, how unpure your thoughts can be, how frustrated you can get. I mean, the simple things can annoy us. And, and so we know that we aren't pure. But what Paul argues is, is that if we put our hope and trust in Jesus, if we rely on him alone for our salvation and trust his righteousness, then we are pure. The Bible says that we can put on the righteousness of Christ, that when God views us, that's the way he views us and we're pure. But he says, anytime you try and deviate from that and you say it's Jesus plus something, you're adding something impure to the equation. And when you add something impure to the equation, you're messing the whole thing up. I mean, think about a crystal clear piece of a, a glass of water, you know, straight out of, you know, a, a filter or whatever it may be, ice cold, perfect on a hot day. When you, you want to drink that thing, because it's awesome. But if my daughter puts a little bit of dirt in, you think you're going to want to drink it? No, right? It instantly becomes impure. And what he's arguing is exactly that, that we can't play both, that it's not Jesus plus something, because when you add something, automatically it becomes impure. And so what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, do we truly believe the gospel? The gospel says that it's through faith in Christ alone, through what he accomplished on the cross alone, that we're saved. That's the only way that our relationship with God can be restored. And so this is the argument that we see. He's fighting against this to say it's Jesus alone that brings salvation, not Jesus plus something. And in this case, it's myths and genealogies, or maybe even that they have to obey certain Jewish customs, which is what we see in um, the, the book of Galatians, the letter to Galatians, where he fights those who are part of the circumcision group as well. And this is kind of what he's saying. What do you put your hope and trust on? Some are teaching, hey, you can become like the culture around you. It doesn't matter. Others are saying, hey, um, you know what? 
You actually have to have Jesus plus all this other stuff. That's how you're really saved. And Paul says that both of these are distortions of the gospel. As a matter of fact, he uses some pretty harsh words there, especially about those who try and add Jesus plus something. He says, they claim to know God, but their actions, they deny him. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing good. So what he's saying is believing in these things is denying the gospel of Jesus. And, and it, it basically it is like we didn't have faith at all. And so I want you to see the power of this. It, it's, it's such a distortion here that he's going to speak against it. So what do we see? Here's kind of the situation. This is the false teachers. And here's where we see Paul encouraging the elders to go after this thing. You know, he doesn't say, hey, they lived in a very pluralistic culture just like we do. Um, where, hey, you know, there's all kinds of people who believed all kinds of different things. Uh, it, they were known for being syncretists who would bring in the Greek gods and the Roman gods and the Egyptian gods. And you could kind of believe what you want. And in that day, it would have been very fine for, for Paul just to say, hey, take a little bit of the Crete culture and what they believe about gods and this and blend it all together, and that's okay. And he could have just said, you know what, let, let, be, let it all be alone. It's okay. But that's not Paul's interaction with it. No, what he said is that these false teachings are leading people to not put their faith in Jesus at all. And so we need to do everything we can to fight against it. And so he charges the elders to go on the offensive and the defensive against these false teachers. That's why I started my sermon with what I did. The offensive is that they, they need to, to go and speak against the false teachers. And there's two ways that he says that they need to go against these false teachers. There's two things he calls the elders to do. The first one is to silence the teachers. Don't give them opportunity to teach in the church. The language there of silence, some of your versions may have a muzzle, but that really is kind of the image that's there. The Greek word is literally to, to, to muzzle them. In other words, they're going to be barking dogs who are going to try and attack the church. They're doing everything they can to get attention, use all the flowery language they can. But he says, you don't need to let them speak. Rather, you need to silence them. Don't give them the opportunity to teach in the church. Don't give them that opportunity. They need to be muzzled. And so that's the first offensive that we see. The second thing he says, though, is that you need to rebuke them. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe I say I rebuke my kids, but that's not really my vocabulary at all. I mean, rebuking is really kind of disciplining, and it is kind of um, calling them to task, to say, no, 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 that's not right. And he says, okay, first you need to silence them. Don't give them a platform to speak in the church. Second thing you need to do is you need to call them on their false teachings. But I want you to see something here. They're calling them to task with the goal in mind. And that goal is ultimately that they would come to put their faith in Jesus, that they would have true faith. And so all of this isn't just about power games. Sometimes when we read letters like this, it's like it feels like it's a power game and it's just two personalities fighting against each other. No, no, no. This is about truth. And Paul says they're speaking lies, and so you need to not give them a platform to speak those lies. And two, you need to call out their lies. Well, why? Not just so you can win and that you can be the one in charge, but rather so that these people know the gospel and aren't bought into the false teachings that they're giving. And so this is the attitude. This is the offensive that the elders are called to do. So in this church, we'll stand for truth. We, we will say, this is right, this is wrong. We, we will call that. And if we have to, we will say, hey, look, what you're saying isn't true. And, 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 and we, we can't. The elders have the right, if I say something from this pulpit, pulpit, to call me on that. That's part of their job. I don't have an empty platform here to say whatever Brad wants. If what I say is not in line with the Bible, then I have no reason to be up here. And the elders have every responsibility to call me on that. And so what I want you to see here is that this is the attitude. This is the offense that they're supposed to take. The second thing we see, though, is that they're also supposed to be defensive. And the defensive actually comes mostly from the verse ahead of it, where it says that they need to teach sound doctrine, encourage others by sound doctrine, and refute those who oppose it. And, and really that part of it is, is that the job of 
the elders is to make sure that people know what truth is so that they can spot, or spot false teaching. This is the job of the leadership of the church. But I want you to also realize this is the job of all of us to r- listen to everything we hear and put it through the filter of Scripture. Does it line up with what the Bible says or not? Our attitudes, our actions, everything, how does it line up? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Because here's the thing. We need to continue to confront false teaching today. Because false teaching happens all the time. If you listen to the radio, if you listen to your friends and the culture around you, if you listen to your classmates at school, if you listen to... uh, what, turn on the TV. I, I mean, we are inundated with false teachings. And, and we need to realize that that's just the world in which we live. Our world is not going to necessarily affirm our Christianity. And so we need to be able to, to delineate what's true and what's not. Now, here's the thing. I want to one, add one caveat. We need to make sure that we shout when Scripture shouts and we whisper when Scripture whispers. What does that mean? Well, Scripture is clear that there are certain things that if we don't have it, we don't have the gospel. God created the world out of nothing. Um, We're sinners in need of God's grace. The only way that we can be saved is through what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. That Jesus was God and man. That he was born of a virgin. That he lived a sinless life. That he died and was resurrected. That he's coming back again. I mean, that's just a handful of things, okay? Okay. Those are, if we don't have that, we don't have the gospel. And we need to shout and boldly proclaim those things. That Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. But there are other areas that sometimes we as churches can come together and we can shout about. Let me give you two examples that are pretty easy for me to pick at. How do we raise our kids? Here's the clear command from scripture. Train your parents in the way of the Lord. That's my job. What? What did I say? Parents. Parents. I need to be trained in the way of the Lord too. Right? But my job as a parent, my number one task is to train my children in the way of the Lord. Right? Even though my kids would like to think it, it's not to provide them every toy they want on their wish list. Right? It's not to provide a fancy house or everything they want. No, my job is to train them up in the way of the Lord. That's the clear command from Scripture, and I can't waver from that. That's one that I need, to, I, I need to remind myself over and over again because guess what? Culture tells me, ah, you got to do all these other things. That's important. Help them reach their potential and do everything that they want to do. And I mean, and it's good. I want to develop my kids and use their gifting in the way that they're called, that, that God created them. But ultimately, my job is to train them in the way of the Lord. Well, how do I do that? Well, the Bible has principles, but it doesn't say that you have to send them to a Christian school or a public school or homeschool. There's flexibility there. So what will we we bank on? What will we speak boldly about? That it's our job to train our children in the way of the Lord. Where is it where there's some flexibility and freedom depending on who your kid is, how you, what kind of school you send them to. So again, we're not going to, we're not going to shout about some of the smaller issues that are important You need to figure out how to raise your kids, but miss the big ones. We're all things like something as simple as um, as how we dress. I remember when I was a youth pastor, I got a lot of slack when I first went to a traditional church because guess what? I didn't wear a suit coat. And everyone around me did. And there was this big debate about how do you come to church dressed? What's the right way to be dressed? Um, and, and some people thought the only way that you could do it is by dressing up and showing reverence and awe. Now, there's nothing wrong with dressing up. Dress up. If you want to come in with respect and honor, do that. That's a great way to come to church. But there's also a, a mode of I can come because of what Christ has done, dress as I am, that I don't have to put on a pretense. And for some people, to dress up feels like a pretense. And so what's the important thing? That we come together and we gather for worship and that we're the community of Christ together, not necessarily how we dress. So we need to make sure that we, 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 we really do deal with these things and we don't get sidetracked by them. But we also need to make sure that we don't buy into cultural assimilation. 
And what I mean by that is, to be relevant, we must allow our culture to influence our definition of truth. What that is, is biblical truth minus, and you can fill in your blank, any new cultural understanding that, the, that our culture has. And maybe it's, well, Jesus is one of the ways. I mean, you know, you guys are kind of narrow-minded, and you, you think that, you know, you're the only, Christ is the only way? Like, that's not really the way things are today. That, that might have been way back then, 2,000 years ago, where, you know, that was the case. But that seems a little old-fashioned today. How about, how about Jesus is one of the ways? That sounds a little bit more palatable right now. Um, and so it's biblical truth minus something equals cultural assimilation. Uh, or it could be any, pick your sins, materialism. We think that our job is to live the American dream and have fancy cars and fancy houses and everything we need. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that. It doesn't say that we can't have a nice house. It doesn't say that we can't drive a car. But that's not our major priority. Our major priority is that we are Christ followers and that we follow him. Pick, your, pick, pick any kind of a thing. It's, it's the biblical truth minus something equals cultural assimilation. And, and that's what we, we fight. So it's this idea that I said that the church absorbs so much of the world's culture that it's difficult to determine how their lives are different. And in all the areas where the two cultures collide, the world's culture dominates. And what Paul warns us again is this attitude that we let anything go, that we think just because the Bible said it 2,000 years ago that, it's, or that, that it's, it's outdated and we don't need to follow it. Well, that's not what Paul says. Paul says, no, 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 no. Hey, listen, we can't become like our culture. That's not what we're called to do. Rather, God's truth is that Christians are sent into the world but called to be different than it. I like this word. I'm stealing it. Culture, cultural acculturation. I know I'm using big words, even for me, I had to Google this stuff because I was trying to figure out this nuance. But if you, you talk to sociologists, what they say is assimilation is where the major culture takes over a smaller, more minor dominant culture. But a cultural um, acculturation is where they take on some aspects of it. They learn to walk in that way, but they retain their own identity. That's a major difference. And if you look at the Bible, this is what we're called to be. The church is called to absorb some of the world's culture so that it can engage them, but their core beliefs are unchanged. Well, where do I get my biblical rationale for this? Well, Romans 12, verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and perfect and pleasing, or his pleasing and perfect will, which is basically you'll know what truth is and what untruth is. You'll be able to spot that, that false doctrine. At the same time, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 22, and really all through 20 through 22, where he says, to the Jews, I kind of talked in Jewish ways, and I dressed in Jewish garb. To the Gentiles, I didn't. But I, to the weak, I became the weak to win the weak, and I become all things to all people, so that by all means possible, I might save some. And so, yes, we live in a culture, and we, we can't be like the Amish, and totally isolate, right? No, that's not what the church is called to do. We're, we're called to live in the world we're, we're, we're here, the era that we're in, and we're called to take on certain aspects of that culture, to engage it. But the goal is, is that we engage, that we, we kind of look at everything through a filter of the Bible and say, how does this whole thing fit? And the goal is that the world can see that, yes, we can speak their language, but yet there is a difference. And this is what we're called to be. We're called to cultural uh, uh, acculturation. That's what we're called to be. So the world can see. That's God's truth. That's what we're called to be. So I want you to think about that. What are some of the ways that maybe you've bought into some of your cultural ideas about who God is, who Jesus is, the way we should live, the priorities of our lives, those are all simple things that can affect us, and we need to kind of look at it through the biblical lens. The other thing that we see that we need to root out is this idea of the false teaching of Jesus plus anything equals salvation. Remember, Paul spoke pretty harshly against this. Paul said, hey, um, you either put your hope and trust in Jesus. If you add anything else, you're making things impure. And so we need to be careful that when it comes to salvation, that we put our hope and trust in Jesus alone. And, and that we put our hope in that, that it's not Jesus plus anything equals salvation. 
rather than it is Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. We all sometimes put, say, yes, this is what we believe, but in lip service, we, we, we kind of, in our hearts, we kind of think, oh, well, it's something else. Maybe it's Jesus plus morality equals salvation. We can say, well, God, the only way that God can truly love me is if I get my life back together, and I get my act together, and I, I, I kind of shape up, and it's only if I shape up, then, I'll, then Jesus will love me. Well, that's not the way salvation works. Christ died for us while we were still sinners and powerless and ungodly, is what Romans tells us. And yes, part of the Christian life is growing in that and what, what it means to put faith in Jesus, but that's different. That's out of gratitude of what Christ has done, not to try and earn Christ's salvation. It can be certain viewpoints on certain things. Like I said, some people can say, uh, you know, um, if you're the only person who's a Christian is if they do certain spiritual disciplines or if they only hold to certain viewpoints, then they're only Christians. Now, again, we don't want to be wishy-washy. We want to speak the truth, and we need to hold to those things that are important. But if we add anything to Jesus, then it's not true. That's, think about the cults. The cults look on the outside pristine like they have everything. But ultimately, they add to Jesus plus something. Jesus plus the Book of Mormon equals the LDS church, right? Um, Jesus plus whatever equals, I mean, you pick it. Well, following a certain follower or eating certain kinds of food it can go all kinds of ways, but ultimately we need to fight that false teaching and we need to make sure that we, we base it on the truth. So what are those things that you sometimes want to add to the gospel? Again, we may not do this in our, on our heads, but often we do it in our hearts. We doubt if we don't grow, if we don't accomplish certain things that we think, if we're not moving as fast as we should in our sanctification process of growing to become more like Christ. Sometimes it's a conviction from the Holy Spirit that we need to grow and give up these things, but oftentimes it's an attack from Satan saying, you don't, God doesn't really love you, um, and it gives all these lists. But the goal is to try and take you away. And Paul says, no, no, no. If you want to have the truth and the biblical truth, you need to hold through that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and what Christ has done alone. So this is what we need to remind ourselves of over and over again. That Christians are saved solely through faith in Christ and the salvation that he accomplished on the cross. That's what it's about. That is what our hope is in. It's not, now, it doesn't give us an excuse. I put up the Ephesians 2 passage here because I think it helps remind us of the way things work. It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Who's the subject of all this? Who does all the action? It's not me, and it's not you. It says that we are saved through faith. That's the only thing, maybe our part. But it says it's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. God's the one who moved God's the one who accomplished it on the cross. He's the one who gave us that, that salvation. And even the good works that he wants us to do, those things that we, we do out of gratitude, those are all created by God in advance to do. And so it's all about God and what God did, not about us. And so this is, the, the, this is what we have to ask ourselves over and over again. Are these things glorifying ourselves or are they glorifying Christ and what he accomplished? That's the goal. Here at Crossway, we want to be about one thing, and that is reminding ourselves of what Christ accomplished on the cross and that that is where our hope and our strength is ultimately found. Because all those other things that we try to add to the gospel will ultimately fail us. They will ultimately fail us. Our relationships will be destroyed our, our, our ideas of what we think are right or wrong will be destroyed, all those things. But the one solid thing that we can put our hope and trust in is Jesus. And he will always be our strength and our, our, our source because that's the plan that God had for salvation. And so we want to remind ourselves, 
what is it that we put our hope and trust in? Is it that we have a comfortable life? Is it that we can have the success that we think? Is those the things that we think brings value or worth to our life? Or is it ultimately that the only thing that matters in our life is that we have salvation through what Christ has done? And that is what brings meaning and hope and value to our lives. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the message that Paul wants us to impress in our hearts over and over and over again. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.